Book Fourteen, Part Three of Ovid's Metamorphoses. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christina Vasilevsky. Metamorphoses by Publius Ovidius Naso. Translated by Brooks Moore. Book Fourteen, Part Three. Under the sceptre of Ascanius, the Latin state, transferred was Alban too. Silvius ruled after him. Latinus, then, wearing the crown, brought back an older name. Illustrious Alba followed after him. Epitus next in time, and Capus next, then Capitus. And reigning after them, King Tiberinus followed. He was drowned in waves of that Etrurian stream, to which he gave his name. His sons were Remulus and fierce Acrota. Each in turn was king. The elder, Remulus, would imitate the lightning, and he perished by a flash of lightning. Then Acrota, not so rash, succeeded to his brother, and he left his sceptre to the valiant Aventinus, hill-buried on the very mountain which he ruled upon and which received his name. And Proco ruled then on the Palatine. Under this king Pomona lived, and none of all the Latin Hamadryads could attend her garden with more skill, and none was more attentive to the fruitful trees. Because of them her name was given to her. She cared not for the forests or the streams, but loved the country and the boughs that bear delicious fruit. Her right hand never felt a javelin's weight. Always she loved to hold a sharp, curved pruning-knife, with which she would at one time crop two largely growing shoots, or at another time reduce the branch that straggled. At another time she would engraft a sucker in divided bark, and so find nourishment for some young, strange nursling. She never suffered them to thirst, for she would water every winding thread of twisting roots with freshly flowing streams. All this was her delight, her chief pursuit. She never felt the least desire of love, but fearful of some rustic's violence, she had her orchard closed within a wall, and both forbade and fled the approach of males. What did not satyrs do to gain her love? A youthful crew expert at every dance, and also pans their brows wreathed with the pine, Silenus too, more youthful than his years, and that god who is ever scaring thieves with pruning-hook or limb, what did they not to gain her love? And though Vertumnus did exceed them in his love, yet he was not more fortunate than they. How often disguised as a rough reaper he brought her barley ears! Truly he seemed a reaper to the life. Often he came, his temples wreathed with hay, as if he had been tossing new-mown grass. He often held a whip in his tough hand. You could have sworn he had a moment before unyoked his wearied oxen. When he had a pruning-knife, he seemed to rear fine fruit in orchard-trees, or in the well-kept vines. When he came with a ladder, you would think he must be gathering fruit. Sometimes he was a soldier with a sword, a fisherman, the rod held in his hand. In fact, by means of many shapes, he often had obtained access to her, and joyed in seeing her beauty. At length he had his brows bound with a cap of colour, and then, leaning on a stick, with white hair round his temples, he assumed the shape of an old woman. Entering so the cultivated garden, he admired the fruit, and said, But you are so much lovelier! And, while he praised her, gave some kisses, too, such as no real beldam ever gave. The bent old creature then sat on the grass, gazing at branches weighed down with their fruit of autumn. Opposite to them there was an elm-tree beautiful with shining grapes, and after he had praised it with the vine embracing it, he said, But only think, if this trunk stood unwedded to this vine, it would have nothing to attract our hearts beyond its leaves, and this delightful vine, united to the elm-tree, finds its rest, but if not so joined to it, would fall down prostrate upon the ground. And yet you find no warning in the example of this tree. 
You have avoided marriage, with no wish to be united. I must wish that you would change and soon desire it. Helen would not have so many suitors for her hand, nor she who caused the battles of the Lapithae, nor would the wife of timid and not bold Ulysses. Even now, while you avoid those who are courting you, and while you turn in your disgust, a thousand suitors want to marry you, the demigods and gods and deities of Alba's mountain-tops. But you, if you are wise, and wish to make a good match, listen patiently to me, an old, old woman. I love you much more than all of them, more than you dream or think. Despise all common persons, and choose now Vertumnus as the partner of your couch, and you may take me as a surety for him. He is not better known even to himself than he is known to me, and he is not now wandering everywhere from here to there throughout the world. He always will frequent the places near here, and he does not, like so many of your wooers, fall in love with her he happens to have seen the last. You are his first and last love, and to you alone will he devote his life. Besides all, he is young and has a natural gift of grace, so that he can most readily transform himself to any wanted shape, and will become whatever you may wish, even though you ask him things unseen before. And only think, have you not the same tastes? Will he not be the first to welcome fruits which are your great delight? And does he not hold your gifts safely in his glad right hand? But now he does not long for any fruit plucked from the tree, and has no thought of herbs with pleasant juices that the garden gives. He cannot think of anything but you. Have pity on his passion, and believe that he who woos you is here, and he pleads with my lips. You should not forget to fear avenging deities, and the Idalian who hate all cruel hearts, and also dread the fierce revenge of her of Ramnus land. And that you may stand more in awe of them, old age has given me opportunities of knowing many such things. I will relate some happenings known in Cyprus, by which you may be persuaded and relent with ease. Iphis, born of a humble family, had seen the famed Anaxoreti, who was of the race of ancient Teucer. He had seen her, and felt fire inflame his bones. Struggling a long time, he could not subdue his passion by his reason, so he came a suppliant to her doors. And having now confessed his ardent passion to her nurse, besought her by the hopes reposed in her by the loved girl, not to give him a cold heart and at another time, with fair words given to each of many servants, he besought their kindest interest with an anxious voice. He often gave them coaxing words engraved on tablets of soft wax, and sometimes he would fasten garlands wet with dew of tears upon the doorposts, and he often laid his tender side night long on the hard threshold, sadly reproaching the obdurate bolt. Deafer than the deep sea that rises high when the rainy constellation of the kids is setting, harder than the iron which the fire of Noricum refines, more hard than rock which in its native state is fixed firm rooted, she despised and laughed at him, and adding to her cruel deeds and pride, she boasted and deprived him of all hope. Iphis, unable to endure such pain prolonged, spoke these, his final words, before her door. Anaxoreti, you have conquered me, and you shall have no more annoyances to bear from me. Be joyful, and prepare your triumph, and invoke God Pion, crowd yourself with shining laurel. You are now my conqueror, and I resigned will die. Woman of iron, rejoice in victory. At least you will commend me for one thing, one point in which I must please even you, and cause you to confess my right of praise. Remember that my star-crossed love for you died only with the last breath of my life. And now, in one short moment, I shall be deprived of a twofold light, and no report will come to you, no messenger of death, but doubt not, I will come to you so that I can be seen in person, and you may then satiate your cruel eyesight with my lifeless body. If you, gods above, you have some knowledge of our mortal ways, remember me, for now my tongue can pray no longer. Let me be renowned in times far distant, and give all those hours to fame which you have taken from my life on earth. 
then to the doorpost which he had often adorned with floral wreaths he lifted up his swimming eyes and both his pallid arms and when he had fastened over the capital a rope that held a dangling noose he said are these the garlands that delight your heart you cruel and unnatural woman then he thrust in his head turning even then towards her and hung a hapless weight with broken neck the door struck by the motion of his feet as they were quivering seemed to utter sounds of groaning and when it flew open showed the sad sight all the servants cried aloud and after they had tried in vain to save him carried him from there to his mother's house to her because his father was then dead she held him to her bosom and embraced the cold limbs of her dead child after she had uttered words so natural to the grief of wretched mothers after she had done what wretched mothers do at such sad times she led a tearful funeral through the streets the pale corpse following high upon the bier on to a pyre laid in the central square by chance anaxarete's house was near the way through which the mournful funeral was going with the corpse and the sad sound of wailing reached the ears of that proud girl hard-hearted and already goaded on by an avenging god moved by the sound she said let me observe their snivelling rites and she ascended to an upper room provided with wide windows scarcely had she looked at iphis laid out on the bier when her eyes stiffened and she turned all white as warm blood left her body she tried then to turn back from the window but she stood transfixed there she then tried to turn her face away from that sad sight but could not move and by degrees the stone which had always existed petrified in her cold breast and took possession of her heart and limbs this is not fiction and that you may know salamis keeps that statue safe today formed the virgin and has also built a temple called venus the watchful goddess warned by her fate o oh sweet nymph lay aside prolonged disdain and cheerfully unite yourself to one who loves you then may frost of springtime never nip your fruit and bud nor rude winds strike the blossom when the god fitted for every shape had said these words in vain he laid the old woman's form aside and was again a youth on her he seemed to blaze as when the full light of the brilliant sun after it has dispelled opposing clouds has shone forth with not one to intercept he purposed violence but there was then no need of force the lovely nymph was charmed was captivated by the god's bright form and felt a passion answering to his love at proca's death unjust amulius seized with his troops the whole ausonian wealth and yet old numitor obtaining aid from his two grandsons won the land again which he had lost and on the festival of palais were the city walls begun king tatius with his sabines went to war tarpeia who betrayed the citadel died justly underneath the weight of arms then troops from cures crept like silent wolves without a word toward men subdued by sleep and tried the gates that ilia's son had barred then saturn's daughter opened wide a gate turning the silent hinge venus alone perceived the bars of that gate falling down she surely would have closed it were it not impossible for any deity to countervail the acts of other gods the naiads of ausonia occupied a spring that welled up close to yanus's fane to them she prayed for aid the fountain nymphs could not resist the prayer of venus when she made her worthy plea and they released all waters underground till then the path by yanus's fane was open never yet had floods risen to impede the way but now they laid hot sulphur of a faint blue light beneath the streaming fountain and with care applied fire to the hallowed ways with smoking pitch by these and many other violent means hot vapors penetrated the source of the good fountain only think of it those waters which had rivalled the cold alps now rivalled with their heat the flames themselves and while each gate-post steamed with boiling spray the gate which had been opened but in vain to hardy sabines just outside was made impassable by the heated fountain's flood till roman soldiers had regained their arms after brave romulus had led them forth and covered roman ground with sabines dead 
and its own people, and the accursed sword shed blood of father-in-law and son-in-law. With peace they chose at last to end the war, rather than fight on to the bitter end. Tatius and Romulus divide the throne. Tatius had fallen, and you, O Romulus, were giving laws to peoples now made one, when Mars put off his helmet and addressed the father of gods and men in words like these. The time has come, for now the Roman state has been established on a strong foundation, and no more must rely on one man's strength. The time has come for you to give the prize, promised to me and your deserving grandson, to raise him from the earth and grant him here a flirting place in heaven. One day you said to me before a council of the gods, for I recall now with a grateful mind how I took note of your most gracious speech, him you shall lift up to the blue of heaven. Now let all know the meaning of your words. The god, all-powerful, nodded his assent, and he obscured the air with heavy clouds, and on a trembling world he sent below harsh thunder and bright lightning. Mars at once perceived it was a signal plainly given for promised change. So, leaning on a spear, he mounted boldly into his chariot, and over blood-stained yoke and eager steeds he swung and cracked the loud resounding lash. Descending through steep air, he halted on the wooded summit of the Palatine, and there, while Ilya's son was giving laws, needing no pomp and circumstance of kings, Mars caught him up. His mortal flesh dissolved into thin air, as when a ball of lead shot up from a broad sling melts all away and soon is lost in heaven. A nobler shape was given to him, one more fitted to adorn rich couches in high heaven, the shape divine of queriness clad in the trabia. His queen, her Cilia, wept continually, regarding him as lost, till regal Juno commanded Iris to glide down along her curving bow, and bring to her these words, O oh, matron, glory of the Latin race, and of the Sabines, worthy to have been the consort chosen by so great a man, and now to be his partner as the god Quirinus, weep no more. If you desire to see your husband, let me guide you up to a grove that crowns the hill of Quirinus, shading a temple of the Roman king. Iris obeyed Juno's will, and gliding down to earth along her tinted bow, conveyed the message to her Cilia, who replied, with modest look and hardy lifted eye, Goddess, although it is not in my power to say your name, I am quite certain you must be a goddess. Lead me, oh, lead me, until you show to me that hallowed form of my beloved husband. If the fates will but permit me once again to see his features, I will say I have won heaven. At once her Cilia and the virgin child of Thaumas went together up the hill of Romulus. Descending through thin air there came a star, and then her Cilia, her tresses glowing fiery in the light, rose with that star, as it returned through air. And her, the founder of the Roman state, received with dear, familiar hands. He changed her old-time form, and with the form her name, he called her Hora, and let her become a goddess, now the mate of Quirinus. End of Book 14, Part 3 Recording by Christina Vasilevsky of www.105creations.com